Hello, this is Pastor Rick, and I want to welcome you to the Lectionary Bible Study for this Sunday, February the 20th. We're into the seventh Sunday of Epiphany, and we have three great texts. Uh, Genesis 45, the story of Joseph in Egypt. Remember Joseph with the multicolored uh, coat. Uh, we have 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, here we have Paul talking about our resurrected bodies. What do we look like after the resurrection? And Luke 6, where Jesus talks about stewardship, but he does so in terms of investing in our enemies and the poor. And so before we get into those texts, let's start with a word of prayer. Join me, please. Good and gracious God, we thank you for your mercies, which are new to us each and every morning. Great is your faithfulness, and we pray that your spirit would guide our thoughts uh, this morning as we dive into your word. Give us indeed instruction through your word on how we might live more faithfully to you. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, we start, we're going to start with Luke chapter 6. And this is uh, really quite a powerful story where uh, Jesus, he's already had some healings. Uh, and the healings in Luke uh, right before this uh, text are interesting because Jesus says that he felt the, his healing power come out of him, which is an interesting phrase, right? The healing power coming out of Jesus. And then we have uh, basically his Beatitudes, Luke's version of the blessings and woes. Then we come to this text. And in essence, he's saying, okay, we follow the leader, imitate your leaders. And who is your leader here? It is your father in heaven. So how are you to live? Like your leader, like your father in heaven. Be merciful like your heavenly father is merciful. And so the golden rule here, eh, it shifts a little bit, right? It's not do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You're not the standard. Uh, here, the standard is God's mercy. Do unto others as you would see God's mercy extend to their lives. Now, who are those others? And Luke here extends the idea of stewardship. We're still in our stewardship campaign. And he talks about stewardship as investing in two groups of people. But these two groups are not the ones we normally think about, right? Uh, Luke says you have to invest in your enemies and in the poor. And we're, we, we come up a little short. We say, well, why is that? And he said, well, look, even the Gentiles can give to their friends and their neighbors and those who belong to their clubs, right? Because... We give to our friends, and then they give back to us. It's reciprocal. We give to our family, and they give back to us. And here Luke says, well, even the pagans and the Gentiles do that. And so God's mercy here extends for Luke also to the poor, right, and to the enemies. And in Luke's time, uh, that church did have enemies, and they did have the poor. Their enemies certainly were in the synagogue, those Jews who were against uh, their version of Judaism, declaring that Jesus was the Messiah. And so there's, by the time of Luke, there's already persecution, uh, even death, right? We know about uh, Saul persecuting uh, Christians. And they also have the Romans. So they understand enemies, but they also understand the concept of being poor. Uh, not only that they had poor in their neighborhoods, but the early church also was poor and often beggars were also in the pews, right? And so what does Luke say to do? It's very interesting. He says, you should love your enemies, love the poor. You should lend to them. You should do good to them. And then he adds also, you should bless them and pray for them. Five very concrete suggestions on how to practice love and stewardship. Uh, the disciples are also to go beyond non-violent action with this mercy. Uh, I think it's very uh, interesting. And of course, uh, we often question this, right, about the idea of non-violence. If someone strikes you, uh, you, you turn the other cheek. 
if um, someone steals from you, you, you give it to them and maybe even some more. It's kind of interesting and um, some would say it goes too far because if we see violence, uh, sometimes like in families, we have to step in to stop that violence. And so there have been a lot of discussions about how much of this is an individual ethic. I turn my other cheek but because the violence is directed at me, but if it's directed at someone else, that's when I practice neighborly love. That's where I do good, according to this text, and I go and stop the violence there. So again, this is more about the personal ethic and the other types of ethics and practices about opposing violence in the neighborhood. Um, it's a wider conversation. And so Luke raises up this text, all sorts of issues that sometimes can seem abstract if we don't have concrete examples. And so I want to now flip from this story of Luke to a concrete example in Genesis uh, chapter 45. Here, this story of Joseph. And it's a beautiful one because Joseph, remember, he was ganged up on by his 11 brothers and they didn't like him, uh, probably because his father, Jacob, preferred him. The two favorites of the 12 were Benjamin and Joseph. He got the multicolored coat, as we remember, and they didn't like him for all sorts of reasons, and they finally took him out, uh, beat him up, threw him into a well, and went back, left him for dead, went back and told their father that he had been attacked by a wild beast. They brought back his uh, coat of many colors that was blood strewn, uh, but finally, they sold the brother into slavery. He goes to Egypt, and that's when the story turns around. He actually um, interprets dreams for the Pharaoh about um, plight and disease that would be uh, taking famine. And he helps then the Pharaoh withstand the famine. He becomes a ruler, a top administrator in Pharaoh's palace. He helps uh, gather together grain uh, again, in preparation for the famine. And at this, at this time, his brothers come to Egypt looking for grain. And there's some wonderful stories that go on, but finally there's a confrontation between Joseph and his brothers, and they are sort of shocked. And in this text, uh, Joseph says to his brothers, because there, there, there's their brother, they can hardly believe it because they really did think they had sold him into slavery. They had put him in a, on a path to death, right? And here he says, and now do not be distressed or angry, all right, with yourselves because you sold me here for God meant, uh, sent me before you to preserve life. In other words, I've been given this position in Egypt. I have the skill sets. I have the organization to save Life, meaning uh, all Egyptian life because of the famine, but now also to save your life, the lives of my family members, of my father. And so then he asked them to move down to Egypt, to the land of Goshen, and he said, I will then take care of you. So here's this idea that we picked up in Luke. How do you love your enemies? Right now, Joseph says, you're not my enemy, but you know his brothers were his enemies in terms of their behavior, selling him into slavery, lying to their father. And so in verse eight, he said, so it was not you who sent me here, but God. I mean, Joseph has now seen God's hand in all these actions, and he is not holding his brothers accountable, but saying, God sent me here now to take care of you. And then the sons go back uh, to the father. I mean, Jacob could hardly believe it. And that's how then the family comes down to Egypt and they prosper because of Joseph. And so this is a real world example of what Luke is talking about when he says to love our enemies and really to invest in the poor. At this time, Jacob and the family were poor. They had nothing to eat. That's why they had to flee the promised land. So wonderful texts that go together, uh, Luke and Genesis. Our final text is kind of interesting because people are gathered around Paul, it's 1 Corinthians 15, and they're asking him, okay, and these are natural questions, what are we going to be after we die? 
and go to heaven. I mean, what will our bodies look like? And uh, Paul doesn't have his best pastoral moment here. He kind of gets um, impatient. He says, you fools, what are you for asking these questions? Uh, but then he comes back with some great examples because he says, basically, our resurrected bodies have these hidden possibilities. In other words, we don't know. We will be like Jesus. But he uses the example of a seed. He says, you look at a seed, and there are hidden possibilities. And you put it in the ground, and then it produces, uh, obviously, food. Um, uh, first a plant, and then food. He said, that's kind of what the resurrection is like, is that we will be planted, we will die, and then all this resurrection possibilities will emerge. And I, and I love that. He says, first of all, we're the first Adam in our birth, the first creation, then we die, and then comes out a second creation, a, a life-giving spiritual body, so to speak. And that's how he answers uh, the members of the church of, of Corinth about what comes after the resurrection. Hidden possibilities, take a look at seeds. The first Adam offers us dust in the end, but the last Adam offers us eternal life. Okay. Wonderful text for this last Sunday in our stewardship drive. Uh, again, Luke 6, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, and Genesis 45. I hope you have fun with the text so that the Lord blesses you as you reflect on them in preparation for our worship on Sunday, February 20th. See you in worship. Bye-bye now.